Amen. All right, it's good to see everybody here today. And pray for the Lord's blessing for our time of worship. Let's take our chorus books and we'll sing number 10 to begin with. Song number three in that section, The Christ of the Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear sin on dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. To the Christ of the cross I will ever be true. His shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday, for by his grace I am saved, and his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross, till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Lord Jesus Christ meant everything to his Father, and his death means everything to his Father. Because it's by that death that he justified that people that he gave to him. What a complete redemption and redeemer. Just to be able to sing about the Christ of the cross, Christ and him crucified. That's really the whole theme of scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. The Lord gives you that key, it just opens every verse. Every verse. All right, Robert is going to come and read for us now. If you'd like to turn to Psalm 89. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Psalm 89, the reading of the Lord's Word. 
I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reference of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee. Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thy enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitations of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they, they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou speakest in vision to thy Holy One, and said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, or the son of the wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep to him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seeds, his seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgment, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take away him from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the things that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure, endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. But thou hast cast off and abhorred thou has been wrought with thy anointing. Thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. Thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. All that pass by the way spoil him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversary. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast also turned the edge of his sword, and haste not made him to stand in the battle. Thou hast made his glory to cease, and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth hast thou shortened, 
thou hast covered him with shame. How long, Lord, will thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is, wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? What man is that liveth, that is he that liveth, and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Lord, where are thy former loving kindness, kindnesses which thou swearest unto David in thy truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servant. I do bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people, wherewith thy enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thy anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Father God, we come before you this town and we praise you. Lord, we, I hope that we have received Christ in everything that I read today. He is the anointed one. He is the seed. He's the Holy One. And he has blessed his people. And we thank you for that. Let us continue to see Christ every, each and every day. Give us that wisdom that we may know Christ. Be with Brother Ken as he lives the word today. In Christ name I pray. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number 10. And we'll sing this as our call to worship. Hymn number 10. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure sufficient is thy arm alone and our defense is sure before the hills in order stood for earth receive her frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. Time like an ever-rolling string bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guide while life shall last, and our eternal home. And that's taken from Psalm 90, which is actually what's going to be read next time, I think, with Psalm 90. All right, Bob is going to come and read for us now from 1 Peter chapter 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and all hypocrisy, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. <clears throat> if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Where also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion chief cornerstone, elect, precious, if he believeth on him, shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumbled at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a particular people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not <coughs> obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be unto the king as supreme governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Are for the will of God that with doing well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle. But also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if ye be buffeted for your fault and you take it patiently? But if, when ye do well, suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop, bishop of our soul, to your soul. May we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that we read. Open our eyes to see Christ, the only righteousness and sacrifice for the Holy Father, dear Lord. Call us to you, dear Lord. May we put aside the tribulation of this world and today and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with Ken as he brings forth the message in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll claim clear from that portion is we're saved by the blood of the crucified one. And that's what we're going to sing here. Hymn number 210. <laughs> Thank you. 
of which it has to be according to law, it has to be by a just payment. And that's what we see set forth as the message of salvation throughout Scripture. Justified, but by grace, lest any man or woman think that somehow it's because of my contribution or something that I have to influence the judge. That's the problem today. A lot of people don't realize that this trial is already over. They're going about thinking that somehow they've got to present themselves before a holy God with some works of their hands, their zeal, their efforts. But when I say the trial is already over, that means that back in the year of our Lord, when the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life and shed his blood unto death, the trial was over for those that God the Father purposed to save. You say, I wasn't there. Nope, neither was I. But you know what? In time, the Spirit of God, opening this book to me, has showed me that if my name was written on his breastplate as my high priest, then the work was done. And it was done between the Father and the Son. And you know, when the, when the Lord reveals that to you, you just bow and wonder, what grace that without consulting the sinner, the judge, the holy God, declares righteous everyone for whom Christ paid the debt. He didn't have to say it. A lot of people are like, well, I think that's not fair if he just died for ones that the Father gave him. Well, that trial was over all the way back at the fall. A lot of people act like when they come in this world that somehow there's still a trial going on. And they're trying to work out not being as bad a sinner as, as what the Bible says. Well, guess what? That trial was over. Look what happened when Adam fell. It ushered into this world an entire condemnation of his race. Every child that's born in this world, a baby, isn't born innocent. It's born under that curse and that condemnation and will die in that curse and condemnation unless Christ has paid the debt. That's the good news. That's the grace that if Christ has paid the sin debt, then that sinner has been justified. So this is the theme this is the message that I have here for my text here in Romans chapter 3 from verse 19 down to verse 24. The justification, and this is a theme we're going to find recurring here through this epistle of Paul to the Romans, but the justification of sinners before God by his grace alone I keep adding things to make sure we understand. You say, well, grace is grace. Yes, but it's like if your wife sends you to the grocery store and says, you mind picking me up some butter? Have you ever gone to the butter section in the grocery store? You stand there thinking, which butter? All kinds of brands and names and butter this. And can't believe it's not butter type thing. We don't want that when it comes to the grace of God. We need to understand that it is by God's grace alone. This is the foundation of the gospel of God that's taught throughout the scriptures. And I remember when the Lord first opened my eyes because I'd been to school and studied all kinds of themes and backgrounds and cultures, dates, history. I was a walking encyclopedia, but Miss Christ. I remember as he opened my eyes, I went back and started reading, just like a first grader again. Started wondering how on earth did I miss this message of Christ and of God's justifying grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, Christ wasn't even on earth yet in the Old Testament, but he was. You know, when it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, you go over to John chapter 1, John tells us that was Christ. I believe when God walked in that garden after Adam had fallen, what's the voice of God in Scripture? It's the voice of Christ. God has never spoken to any sinner apart from his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Going all the way back from the beginning. 
So he's there in type and picture and prophecy and promise. And so as you go back and read, if the Lord gives you eyes to see, you begin to look for him. Where is he here? Where is he there? He's there, whether we can see him or not. But that is the foundational truth of the gospel. According to God's word, we know that sin has separated us from God ever since the fall and Adam. By one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, it says in Romans 3.23. And when it says there, as in my text, for all have sinned, actually in the Greek that reads all did sin. When did all sin at one time in one place? Because we weren't all born at the same time, right? When Adam fell, he was our representative head. And I hear some say at the same time, well, I don't think that's fair that I should be judged because of Adam's sin. But you know, I find comfort in that because if my sin was due to Adam's sin by imputation, guess what? good news is that salvation then can be by the imputation of the righteousness of another. Not mine, but that which the Lord Jesus Christ came and worked out. I'll tell you, if the Lord ever shows you that, you'll click up your heels and walk out that door singing hallelujah. Because it's in his work. That's what grace is. According to God's word, that bridge or that gap between God and the sinner is such, it says there in verse 23, comes short of the glory of God. I can't imagine if that were the requirement. Somehow I would be required to live in such a way, think in such a way, do in such a way, speak in such a way as that God is glorified in every way through me. But God doesn't set that aside in order to save the sinner. The good news is there is a man that has lived on this earth and has glorified God in every job and tittle, thought, word, and deed, not only let it alone, but the spirit of law. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why God the Father sent him. No matter how zealous or sincere some may be and I run into a lot of zealous and sincere people you do too you look at them and you think it's it's tough to believe that these people can be so nice and kind and the first thing they'll do is try to help you out if you have a flat tire or something they're right there there's a bunch like that in the world and yet have no interest in Christ or even what they know of Christ is not according to Scripture. They just know there's a name, there's a man called Christ, Jesus. So their hope is that they're trusting enough, believing enough. That's not how this works. No matter how good we think we are, no matter how much effort we can do to earn our salvation. I remember being raised under this type of teaching. Say your prayers before you go to bed. Any, anybody raised that way? Make sure you don't have in bed until you say your prayers. And parents teach your kids that way. They're, oh, can't, can't eat food before you say your prayers. All these things kids are being instructed in doing as if somehow God's going to be upset if you don't do it just right. And I remember thinking that way. But I'll tell you, even with your best repentance, down on your knees, crying tears, once you get up, if that's what it required, then you'd have to get right back down there again and repent of your offense. This is of no value to God, not for salvation. So here again, it must be by grace alone. Grace is the unmerited favor of God towards sinners, whereby he saves them. But again, not just looking the other way, but requiring a just payment. Every sin has to be answered. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. It's by God's unmerited favor, undeserved, his love, 
but it's through the complete work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he justifies each one that he has purposed to save. So while this is taught throughout scripture, I'm thankful for how the Lord taught the Apostle Paul because here in this portion and through the rest of this epistle, this is what we're going to begin to see now. Up to now we've been seeing a lot about the sinfulness and the depravity and God's justice in judging, punishing sinners. Now people again will argue, I don't see how God could send people to hell. I wonder that he doesn't send everyone to hell because he's holy and just. So I wonder that he saves even one because that would be a mercy and a grace. But here, again, Paul, by the Spirit of God, he's the penman, but the Spirit is the author of what we're reading here. And therefore, when he says in Romans 3, 23, again, for all have sinned, remember the context. It's not just Gentiles, because the Jews looked at the Gentiles like, ah, oh, they're dirty dogs. They certainly don't deserve the kingdom. And Paul's like, whoa. In case you missed the news alert, Jew and Gentile, all have sinned. There's one standard of condemnation that's our sin. There's one standard of righteousness before God, and that is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what must be revealed to the heart by faith. Faith is the revelation. You see that word faith. That's not something I conjure up. But it's the revelation of Christ and his finished work to the heart of those sinners for whom Christ paid the debt. You ever get those official letters in the mail that you owed something to the bank and you've been owing and every time you get that letter you think, oh, I'm not going to open this again. It's just going to show me more debt. And uh, then one day you decide, well, I guess I better open it. You open it, and the bank says, congratulations, your debt has been paid. You owe no, nothing more on your account. Can you imagine? It's like, what? You call the bank and find out, and someone had come in and had mercy on you, heard about your need, paid off your debt, and you, you're home free. <laughs> Isn't that good news, home free? But that's, that letter comes, that's the faith the Spirit brings home this news to the heart. I can't tell you that it's for you or not. I just know this, that if the Spirit reveals it in your heart, then you'll know it. His Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. It's His work to do from beginning to end. And so as we consider this particular subject, why is the justification of sinners before God by His grace alone? This is one of those ways of teaching where you tell them what you're going to tell them, and you tell them, and you tell them what you told them. And prayerfully, by the time we're through here, it will be centered and sunk into and sown into these hearts of ours by grace alone. First of all, going back to what we studied last time in chapter 3 and verses 10 through 18, the reason this justification or God declaring righteous sinners is by grace alone is because of the universal condemnation of all sinners that requires that the sinner's justification must then be by grace alone. If you think, well, I'm not as bad as that other person, well, you haven't understood then your universal condemnation. And let's be honest, when we grew up, if we grew up in a religious setting, we thought in our minds that somehow we were still better than someone over there in a dark continent bowed down in front of a tree worshiping an idol. At least we're not as bad as they are. Well, you must have missed the memo. 
because the memo says all are condemned from the top of the head to the bottom of the foot. That's what we looked at last time, and that's, that's how it's described there. You're not gonna get out of this scot-free, thinking that somehow that you're not as bad as anybody else. No, there is the universal condemnation of all, every single sinner in the world that has ever crossed the face of this earth that requires then another way. It requires then that for any to be just before God, it must be by God's grace alone. This is something that God must do on behalf of the sinner, not in cooperation, where God says, I'll do this, I'll go so far, now you do the rest, no, by grace alone. What part of grace alone don't you understand? But secondly, and that's what we're gonna look at here in verses 19 and 20, what requires salvation to be by grace alone is our inability. There's this lie being propagated out there that somehow, even though we're fallen sinners, inside of us there's still a little flame that if we can just get the fire brands going, that we can do something believe in Christ, come to Christ, do something to contribute to our salvation. Once again, what's clear here in verses 19 and 20 is our total inability. This is something that requires then that justification be by grace alone because if there was any ability Here's a scripture over here in Ephesians chapter 2. I often quote it, but if you haven't got it circled and underlined, this would be a good time to do it, because I keep quoting it. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, and, or Galatians chapter 2, not Ephesians, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. Look how this is put by Paul. He says, I do not frustrate what? The grace of God. How do you frustrate the grace of God? You can't frustrate God's grace in that sense, but you can, you can misinterpret it. You can pervert it of how it's being interpreted. So when he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God by contributing anything by man, you do that, you change the nature of grace. Because he says, for if righteousness come by the law, that's any obligation, any requirement of God, if righteousness come by the law, in other words, by your keeping the law, what does he say? Then Christ is dead in vain. You make the work of Christ of none effect. Not that you can, but in what it represents, you are perverting the work of Christ. And that's why we can't tolerate a mixed message by people that say they're preaching the gospel, preaching the grace of God, but they put the word but in there. Here's what you need to do now to make it effectual. And together there's a cooperation. You have just perverted the grace of God. So this is key to understanding why justification or the justification of sinners is by God's grace alone. It's because we are totally unable to keep the law, keep what it requires. That's why it's so foolish even to think of a person going back and looking at the Ten Commandments and saying, okay, let me do the checklist here. How am I doing here on, you know, not stealing, not coveting. You can't even begin because it's not just in word and deed, but thought. I dare say if it was on covetousness alone and we were honest before each other, how many covetous thoughts have we had since the morning? No electricity, no internet, can't get gas, all these things because of the storm. Boy, I just wish that I could be, how come that neighbor down there's got lights? <laughs> come on now, I'm, I know some of us have been thinking that. How does that work? God's sovereign, and we'll be thankful. But even on that alone, 
That shows what's in his heart, isn't it? We're unable even to satisfy even in the smallest way. That's why Paul says here in verse 19, whatever the law says, he says, now we know that what things soever the law saith. Why does he come back to the law? Well, in the context, he's talking to some Jews here that thought themselves better because they had the law given to them. But Paul says, whatever the law says, he's pointing out the horrific description of man's utter sinfulness that comes to us in the law. God never gave the law as a means of salvation, only for condemnation, that the holiness of God might be revealed in it. And the more those in the Old Testament thought that they were somewhat and doing all right, well, the, the Lord would add to the law. Why? To add to their condemnation. And this then is describing, as it says there, it said to them who were under the law. This was to silence every critic and to demonstrate the universal guilt of all sinners. Why? It says here that all the world may become guilty before God. That's why the law was given, that every mouth might be stopped. As long as you're saying yes but, <laughs> justifying somehow your actions, your thoughts, thinking, well, I'm not as bad as it, you have not heard the law. Your ears are yet deaf and uh, you've not understood then to that point the importance and significance of the grace of God. It says to those who are under the law there in verse 19. So who are those that are under the law? Well primarily the Jews were because the Gentiles weren't even raised under the law and yet the law still stood as a demonstration of God's holiness and justice but it's clear here verse 20 regardless of you can't even plead ignorance you know, this is like getting pulled over and you're trying to let the cop know I didn't know about it, it doesn't matter here's the law let me educate you, you know, while I'm doing that give me your driver's license I'll be right back fine you can plead all you want to, but if he applies the law as it states or is required, ignorance is no justification for breaking the law. And remember that many of the Jewish people in Paul's day, they would take every passage of the Old Testament. How many times we did this growing up too? You'd read it, and every time evil people were mentioned, who'd you always think of? Somebody else. That's where the Pharisees were. They would always take the scriptures describing evil and they'd apply it only to the Gentiles. Why? Because we have Abraham as our father. They were proud of their heritage. But Paul makes it clear here in this particular instance, he's addressing such that have those thoughts. God speaks to those who are under the law. In reality, the fact that we were raised with this Bible and read these scriptures from our youth up makes us even more guilty. Not that you could be any more guilty than anybody else, but as far as our own thinking, the fact we had this word and still we rebel and we sin against that. The law, which is its purpose is to reveal the very holiness of God and his character. And to treat it lightly, that only adds to our condemnation. Verse 20, by the deeds of the law, there will no flesh be justified in his sight. This is why salvation and justification must needs be by grace alone. Guilty ones meet over here in this corner. And then stand by and watch. They're thinking, I don't want to go over there. It means condemnation. I think I'm going to wait here and see if there's another way. There's not another way. But the Lord is pleased to teach us of our guiltiness. And our mouths are stopped, as it says there in verse 19. And 
we are brought to see that by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. That's where we come to see that not only our efforts cannot deliver us, but the law is not a friend. So think about it. The law is our enemy. It stands against us as sinners. And again, that's why our justification must then be by the grace of God. All the law can do is give the knowledge of sin. You see that in verse 20? The end, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The more we go back and read the law, the more we should see by God's grace our sinfulness. And be brought again to acknowledge that unless God has been pleased to justify us by his grace through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he didn't just set aside the law, God can't do that. But that's why he sent his son to earn and establish that righteousness in every thought, word, and deed, to render unto God the Father that perfect obedience, God then would be just by his grace through Christ to declare righteous those sinners for whom he came. Let that ring in your mind that by the deeds of the law, no matter what effort, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm not as bad a sinner. Isaiah wrote in 64, Isaiah 64, 6, that all of our righteousnesses, it's in the plural, are what? Filthy rags. Doesn't say our sins. Our righteousnesses. Every attempt and effort. I know someone's sitting there thinking, boy, you sure are laying us low. Not as low as it needs to be. But if the Lord ever teaches us who we are, boy, we're flat on our face. Begging mercy. And here's the good news that in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he came to accomplish that's what he did. That's what it says there in verse 21. That this, the revelation of the righteousness of God, how God could be just to declare sinners righteous, is salvation by the grace of God alone. That's the only answer. No matter how you turn around this thing. I love this word, but now. That's a time word, by the way. Paul says, but now. He's writing on this side of the cross. He was one of those Jews that raised his fist in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ until such times it pleased God to reveal Christ to him. He was, he was a Christ hater. He was of that number that signed the death warrant the Sanhedrin, for Christ to be crucified. And they laid, as a young Pharisee, they laid the clothes of Stephen at his feet while they stoned him for preaching Christ there in Acts 7. They were so angry at Stephen, they rushed on him and gnashed on him with his teeth. You go back and read his message. All he was doing started back at the beginning of the history of Israel and showed that it all had to do with the coming of this very one that they hated. And by wicked hands took and crucified. And Paul was in that number. At that point, Paul looked very much like a reprobate. That's why we shouldn't just write people off. No matter what their hatred. Sometimes on Facebook you have to block them. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is my page. What are you doing writing that hate stuff on my page? But that doesn't mean I've written them off. My prayer is that those that contest, and there are many that contest justification at the cross, many, they want to put it somewhere else other than what Christ accomplished at the cross. But it's clear as we go through there, here from the scriptures, that there was no justification of sinners apart from or until Christ laid down his life and shed his blood. And then when he did, see that's what Hebrews talks about, the, the, the testament that requires, first of all, the death of the tense, testator. It says it's, 
It has no force or strength until the death of the tested. Then all the benefits are given to those that are named in the Testament. Well, that includes all the way back there to Adam and all the way forward to the end of, of time. One place, one time, one sacrifice, one justification. And that's why, don't just jump over that in verse 21 when it says, but now. All's bringing it to a time. You say, what's happened? But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's all about the Old Testament. So he's saying that the law and the prophets foretold the coming of Christ, that in type and picture and prophecy, all the sacrifices, those are all forward-looking. But now, it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So this is the third reason why Justification must needs be by the grace of God. Because God has purposed that that righteousness, that that justification, and if you've got a different translation, make a correction here, because there are some translations in verse 22 that say, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, it's not what it says in the Greek. I don't want to stand up here and give you a Greek lesson, but they have in the Greek a tense that is called the genitive. And the genitive means a possession that someone owns it and only has the right to distribute it. In other words, you don't have the right to come into my house and take my things and go give it to the neighbors willy-nilly and say, well, I think I'm going to help out, help out your neighbors. It's not yours to give. Here, when it says, even the righteousness of God, and there's another point I want to make. Look through Scripture, take a concordance. It, the Scriptures never speak of Christ's righteousness. I know we talk about it. But the only reason Christ came to earn and establish this righteousness was for the glory of his Father. And so complete is that work of righteousness when he finished, God owned it. That's why it's called God's righteousness, because he purposed it, and Christ came and fulfilled it, and right then and there imputed it. There's no break between what Christ accomplished and then the imputing of righteousness. We see that down here in verse 24, being justified freely. You say, well, by his grace. Why should he have to say freely? Well, people don't understand. They're still going to think somehow, they contribute now freely by his grace. And that word being means having been justified freely by his grace out through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's no separation. There's some that say, well, Christ died. And so now he's waiting for those for whom he died to come to him in faith. And when they do, then they'll be justified. No, nope. the redemption and the justification were automatic. If you buy something in the store and you pay, I don't care how long you keep that receipt and you tell them I'll be back to pick it up. Nobody can give that to anybody else. That's yours. Doesn't matter how long it is. You got the receipt. I've done that before. I bought something. They keep put it in the back and I'll come by and pick it up and then I'll forget about it. And then I'll remember, and I'll say, I, I'm going to go back in there. And i walk in, and they're like, well, when was it? Do you have a receipt? Yeah, here's a receipt. Okay. Let's get it for you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter when it's revealed. That's the point I'm making. It was revealed in my heart nearly 2,000 years after the fact. But guess what? The receipt. <laughs> it's in God's hands. And oh, what a blessing to know that I was freely justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. You can't separate it. There was no justification before he paid the debt, and there's no justification separated from what he accomplished already there at the cross. 
but. That's why I believe Paul says, but now, since the cross, this righteousness that God purposed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That means it has to do with his faithfulness. That's what that word faith means. What he accomplished, it's of him. And it is unto all and upon all. That word upon is the word imputed. Them that believe. You say, well, doesn't that just contradict what you said? No. We don't believe in order to be justified. But it is unto all and upon all them that believe. If the Lord gives me faith to look to Christ and I believe, based on this word, what he's declared, that's the evidence that when Christ died. That debt was paid. And he says there's no difference. You can go all the way back to Adam, all the way to the end of time. Every single sinner that has ever been justified before God is by the grace of God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, there is no other way than that. This is just showing us here how this righteousness is communicated. When it says to all and on all who believe, John said, these things are written that you might believe. I'm not just standing up here giving information for you to get a hold of in your head. No, that you might believe. And that believing, you might have life in his name. But it's through the faith of Jesus Christ. Through Christ's faithfulness would be another way to read that. And there is no other way. I wouldn't want any other way, would you? <clears throat> but what a glorious message that is, to be justified freely by his grace. Let that sink in. But always through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If he paid your sin debt, whether you've come to him or not yet, I know this, he's going to draw everyone for whom that debt was paid. And then you'll rejoice. You'll quit trying to put your works to it or your will to it, your efforts to it, think somehow that's what's getting it done now. Like I said, the trial's over. It's in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 475. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, this child forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, this shall be forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. Is shouting forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, this child and forever I am. Amen. We'll be dismissed. Look forward to the next time. <laughs>